And because you know, you know as well as I do, that when you plan a vacation, when you plan something in your life, things do not always go according to plan. Right? Has anyone, you've experienced that before? I've experienced that before, where you plan and you think and you hope and, and you're like, this is what it's going to be, and it's nothing like that. It's amazing how life can just kind of mess with your plans. And I know if I'm planning a 13 plus hour road trip with a three year old and a one year old, there's not enough I can do. Right? There, we're going to do our best. We're going to upload every iPad we have with every movie we have. We're going to pack the car with snacks and, and we're going to probably even bring a portable toilet. Like we're going to do whatever we can to just make it as convenient as we can to do this, this ride. But, but I know, like you know, things don't always go according to plan. And what I want to talk about this morning and what James calls us to is to figure out how do we plan our lives? How do we plan our lives when we live in, in a place and a space where things don't always work out the way we want them to, the way they're supposed to, right? And this isn't just big, big stuff. So some of us in this space, maybe you have some big plans you are moving towards, but even just the daily rhythm, right? The daily routine, the commute to work, the friendship circles that you're trying to navigate, that I'm trying to navigate. These things, what do we do when they don't go according to plans? There, there are two apps that I love. I need them. My iCal and my Wonderlist. My iCal, my iCal is my calendar. That's my planning. I schedule meetings. I schedule what I'm going to do. I have my, my, my uh, weekly schedule built into that. And Wonderlist is like a virtual to-do list. Now, you, if you, you know me well, you know that I love to-do lists. I do. I get excited about to-do lists. I, I'm so weird that if I've already started my day, but I've done some things that day, you know it's coming, right? I will write what I've done on the list just to cross it off to feel better about myself. Because I'm like, look, look at this list. But it doesn't matter the calendar, it doesn't matter the to-do list. There are things that are going to come up during the day that I didn't plan for. There are things that I thought were going to happen a certain way, and they don't. Now, the answer is not a simple, we'll just stop planning. Right? No, one's, no one here is just going to stop planning and just say, okay, I guess because things don't always go according to plan, throw out the list, throw out the calendars, get rid of the goals. It's just, just free spirit. Some of you may navigate your life that way, but, but I think you know that that's not, a, that's not a sustainable means of living. We can't just say, I, I don't know what's going to happen today. All of you in this space, you made a plan to get here today. You executed it. So bravo. Right? You, you plan on But you know that something between home and here could have stopped you. Right? Traffic. Traffic is deadly on Long Island. Maybe you went to Starbucks this morning and you saw a line and you had to say it's either late to church or Starbucks. Right? right? We, we see these things come up all throughout our days. And the answer is not let's stop planning our lives. What I want to talk about today and what, what James talks about is how do you respond when things don't go according to plan? That's the big issue. What is your normal response when things don't work the way they were supposed to, when the relationship doesn't move in the direction it was supposed to, when the job didn't go that way, when the business was supposed to be successful and it wasn't? Whatever it might be in your life, how do you respond when things don't go according to plan? Because we're all going to face that. This is applicable to every single person no matter your season of life. There is something, you're, you're planning a lunch today. You're planning to have people over, whatever it might look like. We all have plans. What if it doesn't work out? How do you respond? That's what James calls us to. Because you have a daily commute, and sometimes there's traffic. And because you have an expectation of a salary, you have an expectation of a raise or a promotion, and sometimes you're like, I've been working here forever, and I haven't seen anything like that. So how do you respond? You, have, you plan a vacation like I do. You know what's so amazing about vacations? They don't tell you the things that you don't want to know about a vacation. Anyone here ever seen a Disney commercial that highlights the lines um, to the rides? No? Or they pan, pan into the fries and then pan away and you say, $30 for fries? They don't, they don't tell you all of that, right? So that's because there's things in life that as much planning as we can try to do, there are things that we just won't see. There are things that are going to come at you. There are things that are coming at me that I didn't plan for. And how I respond is important. That's what God cares about. That's what you care about. That's what your relationships care about. I mean, we can kill relationship after relationship if we continue to show it a negative type of response when things don't go according to plan. No one's going to want to be your friend. You're not going to want to be your friend, right? You don't like being around you when you're upset. I don't like being around me when I'm upset. I feel bad for the people around me who have to be around me when I am upset. And I found that a lot of times I'm upset when things don't go according to plan. So how can we protect ourselves? And the real issue, the heart of the issue is so often, Maybe you've experienced this. I have. 
When something doesn't go according to plan, do you ever feel like someone stole something from you in that moment? Do you ever feel like you lost a piece of you? Right? Like you put a lot of time into this job. You were supposed to get promoted, but she did. Don't you feel like your boss took something from you in that moment? It's natural. It's normal. Why? Because we attach ourselves to our plans. If you've ever had a really strong relationship go really south, you know you lost a piece of you. You invested time. You invested resources. You invested emotions into something, and it didn't go according to plan. And what happens is you lose some of you in the process. God cares about that. He cares so much about you that he doesn't want you losing you as you plan. And so today I want to see from James chapter 4, verse 13 to 15, how there are three views to protect you. I want it to be cool and say three views to protect you, but I'm not cool enough to say that, but I just tried it anyway. Right? There's three views to protect each one of us. Protect us from what? Protect us from losing ourselves to our plans. Because that happens. That happens. Sometimes you'll lose it, right? You know what it's like to lose it when things don't go according to plan? But I'm not talking about losing it. I'm talking about losing you to where you are so crushed because she said no. You are so crushed because the job didn't work out. You are so crushed because the purchase is not happening. You are so crushed because you feel like God doesn't care. There are pieces of you that you are losing all over the place when plans don't work out. And plans aren't going to work out. I don't have to convince you of that. So how are we going to protect ourselves? Well, James says that there's three views that we need to keep in mind to protect ourselves. James chapter 4, verses 13, 14, and 15. Three verses together today. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and we'll read these verses. James chapter 4, verses 13, 14, and 15. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow we are going to a certain town, and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. You may be seated. This is strong scripture this morning. I think that James is getting angrier and stronger at the ends of his writings. Right? You guys remember way back in June? I mean, it was like... Don't worry, temptation's coming, you've got this. Don't worry, God's with you. And now he's, just, he's really getting bold towards the end of his writing. So brace yourself. If you need a refill, get one, all right? But James writes specifically all throughout his letter to Christians. He is writing, so if you're in this space right now and you would identify as a Christian, you'd say, you know what, I'm following Jesus. His words are very strong towards you. Now, if you're not a Christian, you're not excluded from this because what you are discovering is the hope that is available to you. That's a beautiful thing. This is not an exclusive message. This is an invitational message. Scripture is always invitational. It is always inviting us into the grace of God. James right here is getting even more uh, focused in his writing because he's writing to merchants. Our merchants were people who would travel to different cities and they would open up shop. They would create some networking relationships. They would stay there for about a year and hopefully their business worked and they'd move on to another city and do it again. Now, I want to highlight that because it's very easy for us to look at this text and say, well, I'm not a Christian, this doesn't work, and I'm not a merchant, this doesn't work. And I want you to realize that despite what you are, you still fall into this category. Because whether you have a tangible business that you are currently running right now and you are looking for a return on your investment, you are still making investments everywhere and looking for a return on them. Every single one of you are. There's no one that came to church this morning and thought, man, I really hope I get nothing out of Sunday. I hope the music's horrible. I hope Keith makes it super cold because he always does, right? I know I do. I sweat. So I hope that the coffee's bad and I hope no one talks to me. None of us hope that. Everyone came into this space in some way you wanted, and you won't use this language, but follow me. You wanted a return on your investment. What was your investment? Time. And you want to see a return. Your return might be you want to move closer into the grace of God. You want to connect with someone. You want to pray with someone. You need someone to pray with you. And that's just one example, but all throughout your day, you're going to eat a meal and hope the food is good. So all of us, we can understand what it's like to set up shop somewhere, to make an investment, and hope we get a return on it. Now, let me just speak specifically, if you are a business owner, understand this. God doesn't hate your business, okay? He is not out to destroy your business. It might feel like that sometimes, right? Like, come on, Lord, give me a break. God is not, not out to ruin your business so that suddenly you'll choose him. Whatever you're doing in life, you have opportunity to show the grace and love of God to the people around you. 
James is not coming against the merchants. He's not coming against you planners. What he's bringing out is the attitude that goes into planning. What he's bringing out is the way we attach us to our plans. And we know that's true when you look at the response to how your plans don't work out, how you act in that moment. So that's what James is calling us to. And he gives us three views. And the first view he gives us is the view of tomorrow. The view of tomorrow. There is one job in this world that I am most jealous of. It is one job that I wish I could have. I envy you if this is your job. I'm not against you, so calm down, all right? But I, I love your job because it's the one job where you could be wrong on Monday and still have a job on Tuesday. It's a weatherman, all right? And you know it. Now, again, if you're a meteorologist or if that's your background, I'm not against you. I just said I want to be you when I get older, okay? So I'm working towards that. But I love that. Anyone here, you ever have your, your plans ruined because of a weather report? We've all experienced that. And it's amazing because, I mean, meteorology is very sophisticated. I mean, they are doing their best to track what's going to take place tomorrow through sophisticated satellites and through high pressure this and low pressure that and, and blue and red and, and all these different colors and maps. But we're doing our best to predict tomorrow, and yet we could still get it completely wrong. Like, completely. Yesterday was supposed to be a downpour. It was beautiful outside. I loved it. Right? You, ever, you know it's great too when it's wrong in the, in the other way? Like they predict a total blizzard and you go to the store and everyone buys all the milk and bread. For some reason, that's what we need. We buy all that out and then not even a flurry, right? I think supermarkets and meteorologists have something going on, but that's, that's conspiracy theories for Keith. But all of us, we have this view of tomorrow and James calls it out. What does he say there? How do you know? How do you know, he says in verse 14, what your life will be like tomorrow? You know what's amazing? We tend to plan our lives as if we are in control of our lives. We, we tend to take what should be assumptions and make them certain. Right? We, we do that. We're plan I'm planning a trip in two weeks. Now, if you were to ask me where I'll be in two weeks, I would just say South Carolina. That's what I'm planning to do. But there's some switch that goes on in our head where it's not just a plan, but it's a sure thing. No, I, I, it's on my calendar. Like, this is going to happen. And James says, this is one of the first views you need to consider as to why you're losing yourself when your plans don't work out. Because you are banking on something that is not certain. But you're acting like it is. You're acting like tomorrow is a sure thing. And he's saying, how do you know? We can't even predict weather patterns with satellites. But we're making plans for our lives. And again, I'm going I'm to keep disclaimering this throughout. This is not a knock on our plans. This is a knock on the attitude that comes up with our planning. We're going to find out what it is in verse 16 in a couple minutes. There is a certain attitude that we bring into the picture when we bring our calendars out, when we start planning. And so James says, how do you know? How do you know? Now, it's very easy here to use a motivator such as guilt or fear, but those aren't of God. There is not a place in Scripture where God says, hey, this is how you're going to get you to do it. I'm going to guilt you into this. I'm going I'm to shame you into this. He actually says the opposite. He says, I'm going to take away your guilt. I'm going to take away your shame because there's one motivator that actually carries us through, and that's love. And so Jesus demonstrates love towards us by coming to this world. So don't, don't think, okay, planning for tomorrow is bad. I have to protect myself. So we don't, I'm going to live in fear. I'm not going to do any kind of planning because what if I plan and it doesn't work out? That's not the solution. That's not a sustainable way to live our lives. No one not go to work tomorrow and then say, well, pastor said I can't plan to come to work tomorrow. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We have to still make plans. But he says, how do you know? How do you know what tomorrow's going to look like? And then he moves into this, this other view, your view of you. Then he calls out your view of you. Now, I want, I want some participation here. Uh, how many of you, and I'm not going to put you on the stop, you just raise your hand, that's all you have to do, okay? Uh, um, how many of you, you would say you know the occupation and the name of your great-grandfather? Is there anyone in this space? Great-grandfather. I think for a couple seconds, you might need to do some Ancestry.com in your own head, right? Like, let me get this. It's hard. It's hard. Now, what's really funny is, um, and if you get in a little bit and you shoot your hand up, I'll know why, okay? It's all good. Um, what, what's really funny is I was talking to Amy about this on, on Tuesday. We were celebrating our anniversary, and, and we were walking together, and I was telling her, you know, what I'm talking about, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to ask the church if they know the occupation of the, of the great-grandfather, and no one's going to know it, and it's going it's gonna, to it's gonna prove my point. And Amy turns to me and says, oh, my great-grandfather worked on bridges. I'm like, are you kidding me? You just ruined my plan. So that's why I threw in the name part, too. Um, but it's so, it's so funny. Think about it. This person existed... You are here as a result of that person, 
And I'm sure that person lived their lives like all of us do. It's just, oh, I'm going to live. I'm going to survive. I eat a lot of kale, right? Like whatever your strategy is so that you can keep existing. We all live that way. We have this view of ourselves that seems to be so strong. And yet James says, your view of you is jacked up. Your view of tomorrow, how do you know? And then he says, your view of you. See, many of us, if we were to write our own biographies, if we were to to sketch our own biography and entitle it something, we would do something that would be substantial about the significance of our lives. Right? We will pick out a quality of us and highlight it. We want the world to know. Right? If mine would be called Keith, one more scoop. Right, that, that would be, I, this, I have the cover too. I think we, we have the cover. That's exactly what it would be like. I already have the cover. I'm gonna write the book. One more scoop, right? Just, there's nothing that's gonna stop me, right? I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna enjoy life. But what, is, what does James say in that next verse, verse 14b? He says, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. So James says, Keith, you can't call your book one more scoop. You have to call it fog. Here today, gone tomorrow, right? That, that's, that's what James is trying to say. This is your biography. This is your life. And yet for, for many of us in this space, we live our lives as if every single minute is a sure thing to us. It's just how we live. And again, don't lean into the, the desire for fear and guilt. That is not scripture. We don't want to be afraid of what the next minute brings. But James is calling us to consider the reality and the, the fragileness of tomorrow and of us. I got, like, I got like 13 minutes left to speak, right? Truthfully, I don't know that I'll be here in 13 minutes, right? Can I just be real? Like, we don't know. We make assumptions. We act as if. But James is bringing this, this really grave reality right to our faces, right to the people who are looking for returns on their investments and saying, it's not wrong to plan. It's not wrong to go to those cities and want those things. What's wrong is the attitude. You are so certain of tomorrow. You are so certain of you. And when tomorrow doesn't look the way it was supposed to, and when your life doesn't look the way it was supposed to, what happens? We're crushed. We lose a piece of ourselves because we put stock and certainty into places that James says you can't do it. And then in verse 16, he, dr- he brings it out. He tells us what the problem is. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. And all such boasting is evil. That's strong. I know it's strong. You know how I know it's strong? It's tense in here, right? Because James is saying, the way you plan your life, the way you make assumptions and turn them into certainties, the way you consider tomorrow and you, he says it's arrogant. It's boasting. And that's evil. That is pride. There's there's a scripture in the Bible that says pride comes before a fall. I've seen that in my life, man. I've seen where I've gotten so, so built up on me and so sure of what tomorrow was going to look like, and then it all comes crashing down. And you know what I've seen? I lose pieces of me in those moments because it was supposed to be that way. I was supposed to get the job. I was supposed to have the relationship. I was supposed to get the raise. We were supposed to move. It wasn't supposed to look like this. And when those things happen, we lose pieces of ourselves, and that's what God is concerned about for you because God loves you. Because God doesn't want you losing pieces of yourself to something as uncertain as tomorrow or as to you. And there's a third view that James introduces to us. It's the view of God. The view of God. Here's what's so interesting. We put such stock and such certainty into tomorrow and into today. But sometimes we look at God and we say, well, can can we be sure about him? Can can we know him? I, I mean, if boasting is evil and if I am then evil, can I know this God? How do I how do I look to him? James tells us in verse 15, look at this. What you ought to say, what you ought to say is if the Lord wants us to, we will do this or that. Now let me speak into Long Island religious culture, okay? Because we're Long Islanders, right? We are Long Islanders. It's very easy for us to look at a verse like this and say, okay, here's my prayer, here's my repetition, here's my chant. It's just our, our culture. And I will say this, it is never wrong for you to repeat the words of God. It is never wrong for you to repeat whatever, whatever it might be, the, the, our Father, or a passage of Scripture, or a verse. It is never, it, you can't convince me that it's wrong to repeat the inspired words of Jesus. But what's so often the case, I found for me, is I'll grab something like this and I'll say, okay, what I ought to say, and, and then I'll change my, my email signature. And it'll be like, if the Lord wants, signed off, Pastor Keith. And I think, like, that's what this means. Or I'll suddenly start saying this all the time, well, if the Lord wants me to, I'm going to get there. 
And again, it might not be wrong for you to use that language, but James is inviting us into something so much greater than repetition. He is inviting us into something so much greater than just memorization and repeating. He's inviting us into a new view. He's inviting us into a new way of life. And let's remember, who is his current audience? Christians. So he's saying to the Christians, you should. You should. Don't you, don't you know that you should be putting stock in the certainty of your God? He's telling, remember, let, let's follow the track. He's telling Christian merchants that are looking for an investment on their return, you're so focused on tomorrow, but tomorrow's not promised. You don't know what it's like. You're so focused on you, but you are a fog. You don't know what you're going to be like. And he, and he looks at us, and I think with the heart of a pastor, he says, don't you know you should be focused on God? You should be submitting your calendar and your wonder list and whatever device you use to God and bring it to him. But we push against that and say, well, how can I do that? Because of Jesus. It is only because of Jesus. We cannot have a proper view of God if not for Jesus coming to this world. Look what Jesus does. He steps beyond the boundaries of time and restricts himself by time. Is that not amazing? He comes from a place where there is no tomorrow, and he says, I'm going to be subject to a tomorrow. Why? So that you and I who face tomorrow every single day, hopefully, we know that we also carry with us a Savior who's already been there, done that. He's been outside of time. He came into time. He came into time so much that now time hinges on him, right? B.C. and A.D. It literally centers around Jesus. He stepped into time so that you could not put stock in tomorrow or in yourself, but so that you could say, if the Lord wants. And that's not a repetitious word. That's an attitude change. That's moving from arrogance to humility. That's moving from I've got this to he's got this. And how does that change us? Well, then I know if nothing works out according to plan, I am still just as loved and accepted by the Father because I'm now in Jesus not in tomorrow. That, that's, that's the real problem what James is bringing out here. We are not living in Jesus as our identity and our mission. We are living in our calendars in our identity and our mission. It's like when the calendars come out, Jesus goes away. That's what I found. I got to plan stuff. I got to do stuff. We all do. Jesus came to this world because what was at stake was not your iCal, it was your identity. That's what he's concerned about. We are losing our identity to our planning. And so Jesus brings, brings freedom to us so that we can make plans. And even if every single plan were to crash and crumble and fall apart, you don't. You don't have to fall apart. You don't have to come crashing down. You don't have to be crushed. Why? Because our view of God is certain. You ask me about tomorrow, I'm not too sure. I'm uncertain. You ask me about today and about me, I don't know. I mean, I try my best. I mean, I've eaten couscous for years now, right? I'm trying to keep this thing clean, but I don't know. But you ask me about God. Oh, I'm certain. I'm certain about God. How can you be certain? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what this thing hinges on. Isn't that interesting? You understand that if you're considering Christianity, you're considering a religion that does not hinge on the teachings of a person, but on the historical act of a person, that if somehow, some way, you could dig up the bones of Jesus, I'd quit my job? I would. Because that is the defining moment that makes Christianity true. It's not, it's not about, it's not even, it's going to sound weird, but it's not even so much about what Jesus said. It's about what he did. It's about him saying, I'm beyond tomorrow. I'm beyond this body. I'm going to show you. And so the resurrection changes things. And maybe you're in this space and you're saying, I don't know that I'm there yet. Well, can I, can I just, can I change scripture for a second for you? It's not going to be heresy, I promise. James tells Christians what you should say. You know what he tells people who aren't Christians? What you could say. That's the invitation of this passage. That's found all throughout scripture. That's God saying, I sent my son to this world for whosoever would believe in him will have eternal life. So what you could say, if you are finding that you are still losing your life to your plans, well then your scripture is what you could say. What you could be holding on to is identity and mission found in the person of Jesus Christ. And Christians, what you should say and that's not attached with guilt or fear. That's attached with hope. Because you know that you get to say, even if this week is horrible, even if nothing goes according to plan, I am found secure in Jesus. Can we be real? This is hard. This is hard. 
I lose myself to this, especially as a planner, especially as the personality that I am of calendars and to-do lists. And so let me share with you what I had to do just last month as I was getting ready for this. You could do it. It's not rocket science. Of course, I need the Holy Spirit to drop it in my head, so maybe it is. I found that throughout my day, when I was not accomplishing everything on my list, I felt like, I'm going to use this word, I felt like a failure. And I know you look at me and be like, that's ridiculous. No. If I had 10 things to do on my list and I got nine done, even if I got nine and a half done, I would go home and Amy would ask me how was work today and I'd say it was, it was all right. What happened? I didn't get everything done. That was my next sentence. So I focused, my identity was found in accomplishment and success of some list that Keith created. My mission, because my identity was found there, was to get everything done to feel good about me. And I needed the Holy Spirit to remind me, your identity is secure in Jesus. Your mission is to love people. And if you get nothing done on that list, you are just as successful and loved in the Father because of him, not because of you. And so if you go into my office right now, you'll see there's a big postcard right by my desk. There's a postcard on my dashboard too, so you can walk past my car. Because those are the two places I find that I start to think about what I did today or what I'm going to do today. And the postcard simply says, if you only do one thing today, you are just as successful as if you did it all because of Jesus. Amen. I don't know when that card's coming down. It might never come down. <laughs> because I need to constantly be reminded your identity and your mission is found in Jesus. You put stock in tomorrow, you're going to be crushed. You put stock in yourself, you're going to be crushed. You hope in your plans, they're not going to work out. How are you going to respond? And Jesus is inviting us to find such hope that we can plan our lives and we can plan vacations and we can plan relationships. And yet if, if it doesn't go according to plan, we can continue showing the grace and love of God to the people around us because our identity is secure in him. That's good news. And if you don't understand that good news for yourself today, you are invited to what you could say, what you could say. And I'd love to talk to you about it this week. So grab a card in the chair in front of you. There's a spot that says begin a relationship with Jesus. And this week I will connect with you about what it would look like for you to say if the Lord wants us to. That's how we plan our lives. Keep on planning, people. I have to do it. But do not lose yourself to your plans because Jesus found you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news today. We thank you for your grace towards us. We thank you that you love us in spite of us. We thank you that you are so concerned with the people who are losing their identity to their plans that you sent your son to this world so that we could have true, lasting hope, so that we could have a place to place our certainty, not in tomorrow, not in us, but in Jesus, your son. We surrender ourselves to you today, Father. And we know that things won't go according to plan because it's the world we live in. And yet we know even greater that you are in control. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.